Well, good evening. Is it evening? Oh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's 428 my time, mountain time. And I'm going to do blood part four today. <clears throat> and um, I think I don't think there'll be a fifth part to blood. It's not as I don't need as much time as I did for the devil or for the human devil or for other parts of the book. There's just a few things left to wrap up, okay? So you understand the basic principle or the occult uh, value of blood and how it is a currency in the occult system, the dark occult, okay? Uh, along with various psychic energies which can be harvested as well. We have also adrenochrome, which is real. It's not an urban myth. It really is a real thing. And adrenochrome, um, I think as a recreational drug, as something that's used in the public, it's been known since about 1971 or so. And I, I would say that the very first public record we get of it is, um, I mean, other than scientific documentation, which takes place, okay, but the... the first public accounting we get of adrenochrome is in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, um, which is a book by Hunter S. Thompson, subsequently made into a book, I think the, sorry, a movie. I think the book came out in 1971. And um, the movie came out, I think, in 1997, and the movie was done by Terry Gilliam. And um, if, if you don't know it, I'll just briefly set it up for you. There's um, Hunter S. Thompson plays himself. He's basically a character in his own books. Yeah, but he, he goes by the pseudonym of Raoul Duke. And um, he's always traveling with his attorney, uh, w which is how he operated in real life. And they were, I don't know how you would describe these guys. I mean, they were just like, they were rascals, you know. Um, I don't think really bad people. I, I've heard other stuff, but um, I don't. I don't think Hunter was bad. I think he was a good person and he had a good heart, and that's why he left us the information he did. But if you have a chance, take a look at the movie *Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas*. And there's a scene where they're checking into the hotel and off to the side there's a conversation and um, there's a guy I think on a, on a pay phone and he's describing um, a corpse and how it had been harvested. And at that point in the movie there's no relevance to what's going on. Okay, it's just kind of off to the side. And then a little, a little further on in the narrative of the cinema and the narrative of the uh, book, um, the lawyer reveals to um, Hunter S. Thompson that he has adrenochrome, and they briefly discuss it. And it's something like, uh, there's only one place you can get this, and that's, you know, a, a human adrenal gland, and... Um, Generally, it's a, a drug that is harvested as a result of uh, trauma and fe especially fear because that's what uh, adrenalizes uh, the blood and um, makes it more suitable for adrenochrome. And so this, is, this has grown up to be a big part of the conspiracy world and again, what its circulation and distribution is, I don't know. I mean, we have to assume that it can only go to a certain point before it becomes public knowledge and everybody knows about it, right? So you have to kind of keep your mind and your paranoia in check when you engage these things, these uh, darker theories. Yes, they're going on, but always remind yourself that you don't really have a sense of how prolific they are. Um, you can speculate. I, I think the adrenochrome is probably being used by 
anywhere from three to ten million people on the planet. And that's really not that many, right? There's, there's eight billion people on the planet that we know of, if the census is correct. So it's a it's a very um, ten million people would be um, ten times a hundred is a thousand. Yeah, it would be it would be one percent of a billion. So in eight billion, it would be point zero 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 one percent or whatever the math is on that. But it's a lot of people, and it's a lot of dead children. And this is what raises the, the um, awareness of people, is all the children that go missing. Now, in Blood Part 3, I asked a question that I think is worth repeating. Okay? We, we know from Professor, from, from Professor Toth's book, even though he recanted, um, and I'm not going to speculate on why he recanted. I mean, he basically uh, did a news conference, and I think he did it in Jerusalem. And um, he was vilified by his own community, like absolutely vilified. And so he, he said that he wrote the book to be sensationalist, okay? Because he... He wanted to sell copies of the book. But when you actually sit down with the manuscript, it's really not that sensationalist. It's extremely dry. Okay? It's extremely dry. Now, what else can we say about Dr. Ariel Toth? I think, from the interviews I've seen with him, that he doesn't know what parts of his own culture are doing the blood magic, or even if they connect to Judaism anymore. I suspect that there isn't um, a serious Jew alive, and by serious Jew I mean somebody who has given the scriptures in their religion serious consideration, and at some point in their life tried to be observant so every path has its modality my path is time spent within this is the path of the meditator this is the path of the um, the contemplative or the yogi and this is the path I've chosen now it changes your behavior over time you become more moral you become a better person but you don't you don't necessarily start with a strict moral code although most people interested in meditation are probably above average in morality to begin with because you're looking for higher information you're looking for purpose of life and and that means obviously that the delights and distractions of life don't hold as much sway over you as they do for other people I mean, there there are certain people who can just be happy their whole their whole life with a salary, getting drunk two or three nights a week, um, going to their cottage, going fishing, and th there are people who can just enjoy life without any depth of thought as to what's going on, what the purpose is, or any of these things. And you know, God bless them. There's nothing wrong with an incarnation like that, right? We all get incarnations like that. And then when you get to the point where you're starting to ask serious questions and you can't find peace in life, th this is the calling. And so generally, um, you're, you're fairly moral to begin with. Otherwise, you'd get really distracted with all the things in life, all of the... Uh, all of the pleasures and these sorts of things, right? So, the Jewish path is one of observances, okay? They're held to 613 laws. They have to know them all. They're very specific, very bizarre from my perspective as an outsider. 
but I'm not going to comment because uh, I've never practices, practiced the observances of Judaism, so I don't know what effect they have on consciousness, what they bring you into connection with, and these sorts of things. So, but one can assume that Professor Ariel Toth at some point in his life, and most Jews at some point in their life will seriously consider their theology. They will seriously consider what the religion means, what the scriptures mean. And when I asked the question in Blood Part 3, why aren't the Jews telling us who's doing the blood ritual? Because if they spent any time looking at their religion and looking at their culture, they would have the blood covenant explained to them by the rabbis, and they would have blood explained to them by the rabbis. And this would give them a kind of heightened awareness of this culture. Like I said in the last video, like knows like. You have a hundred people in a room, there's two gay guys, they're going to figure out who they are, each other, like knows like, right? Other 98 people won't have a clue who the gay guys are because they don't know because they're not gay, okay? So it's the same thing with every culture, okay? I find, and, and there's a magnetism based on consciousness. Consciousness is always in a, in a state of attraction, okay? And when you get to a certain point, you'll attract people who want to learn from you. And when you get to a certain point in your evolution, you will attract a lot of other very awake people. Pretty much everybody I meet now is either seeking answers seeking to get started on a path of unfoldment or highly unfolded already and many of them have very rarefied talents you know the the people i've met in the last five years since i wrote uh, stardust ranch well including stardust ranch because you know i worked with john edmonds on that book and then i met a lot of people he introduced me to after that and um Everybody in these circles is kind of lit up. It's almost like the X-Men. They're not mutants per se, but everybody I meet now has some psychic ability, which I'm not sure I would want, really. I think it's maybe a little bit dangerous, but um, for me, all I want is spiritual guidance and spiritual connection, and, th and that will give you everything you need to know. That will give you every warning you need. I mean, look where I'm living, right? Look how I live, okay? Look how much time and um, space I've been given by life at a time when most people are having their their free time to think and contemplate and meditate and their their literal physical space, which is held by economy, okay? Space is held by economy, so you have to buy your food, you have to pay your rent or pay your mortgage. So you have to buy the space you live in. And that space is getting more and more difficult to hold now. You know, more and more difficult to hold. So I offer this as evidence that spiritual direction is very good. Psychic is interesting, you know. I think it, it, it's very useful in healing. Um... You know, because a lot of uh, ailments are related to um, something parasitic on a person, something leaching or harvesting their energy, some trauma or imbalance in their energetic system. And certain very tuned in healers can go in and, and fix that. Um, this is not a new thing, though. Um, Medical intuitives have always been around. Um, I think one of the more famous out there now is a woman by the name of Carolyn Mist. Okay? But again, in the psychic worlds, you can be fooled because they're dual. Okay? So, and th this is a very tricky thing, and this is why I personally stay away from deliberate forms of practice which open up the psychic centers. Because 
they're doors that open both ways. So you can go out and look at the realms, but other things can come into you or knock on that door. And it's not necessarily something that you would want, okay? So for me, I focus on the spiritual energies, which are different than the psychic energies. And I guess you could also make the case that necessity drives a person. So a, a person might become a very good um, medical intuitive or that kind of healer if they themselves have been sick for a long time. This is certainly the case with um, Mary Baker Eddy, the woman who founded Christian Science. And um, where am I going with all this? Excellent question. I've just let myself off the leash here. Somebody left the gate open in the backyard and like I'm like a dog running through the neighborhood with this, with this conversation. Let's bring it back into blood. <clears throat> so we're talking about adrenochrome. And again, this is um, negative spirituality. Any form of spiritual practice which cannibalizes another human being, even if you don't kill them, is negative. Okay? Now, we're all being cannibalized now in the Western monetary system, in the Western tax system, in the Western fiefdom, maybe more so than any other people in the world. And you can disagree with me, but let me tell you, I've probably lived in more places than you, and I've probably lived with more different kinds of people than you. And so I have a completely different perspective on what wealth is, okay? So when I engage, and I still have a lot of friends that I grew up with and a lot of friends um, that I've known through various phases of my life, you know, childhood, um, college, university, as we say in Canada, um, friends I've made in the profession, uh, which is technical writing, engineers I've met and stuff. And you hold on to people and you just kind of, you know, go through your life. And my point is that I stay in touch with a fair number of people. And I find that the space of the Western existence now is one of the most tormented. One of the most tormented, one of the most titled Okay, what do I mean by titled? I mean, um, it's very much, the treatment you get in those societies is very much about your title. Or to make a correlation to the caste system in India, the color of the dot on your forehead. Okay, what class do you belong to? I've never liked societies like that. I find... I find the poor people much e easier to live with. But then I'm forced to ask the question, based on my experience on this mountain, what is poverty? The people I live with are more relaxed, healthier, have a better diet, have better water, and a better overall life than most people in the West. If you have to work 12 hours a day to maintain your status for what might be a 10 or a 15 year retirement, okay, and I don't think anyone's going to have a very long retirement anymore. M my parents had a 30 year one, like from their mid 50s to their mid 80s. My dad died at 87. And they enjoyed their retirement immensely. They went all over the world on various trips three-week junkets here and there, the Far East, uh, the Middle East, um, all over the world, right? And they golfed, and they had hobbies. and But the 30-year retirement is not going to exist anymore. It's just not going to exist anymore. 
the way the system is evolving now in the West, you're going to have to... Where am I going with all of this? This is supposed to be blood part four. Blood is a form of harvesting, okay? And I'm explaining how the whole system you live in now is a form of harvesting. It's harvesting your energy. But you're going to go your whole life now, and you're not going to be able to really enjoy more than 10 or 15 years of retirement. So if you retire, I think they're going to raise the age of retirement now. Every time they talk about doing this, there are nearly riots in, in France. It's a very socialized economy, very much uh, run by large and very powerful trade unions. Very, very socialist economy, the French economy, which makes complete sense after they had the French Revolution and cut the heads off of the nobility. So it's, this seems to be a pattern in Europe. And it's, it's, it's part of the karma. You know, there's always a karma to things. Okay? And sometimes I ask questions, and the way I get answers is they come into my timeline. I, I, I don't like a psychic go out and find the information, and I don't recommend you do that. But you can magnetize information into your life. If you have a pure heart, and especially if you meditate regularly, you can ask a question, any question, and you can just say it in your head, or you can just invest the, the energy of curiosity, awe, and wonder into it, and you'll get your answer. But you have to have the ability to recognize the answer when it comes. There's usually a kind of energetic coupling, and it's an, like an aha moment, a revelation, right? Which is the only way I allow myself to get information now, is revelation, Okay. I mean, if I, if I need to figure out the bus schedule, I will read it and calculate what bus I want to catch, the 12 o'clock, the 2 o'clock, to go to the city, or what have you. But in terms of understanding the universe and what's going on with human life here, I literally could not give a rat's ass about any of the sciences. I don't give a shit about biology. I don't give a shit about chemistry. I don't give a shit about physics. I don't care about any of it, okay? And the reason I don't is it's all information that's been yoked through calculation, okay? It wasn't revealed to us. It was calculated or extorted out of our reality, which is how I, th how I think of the mathematical systems and the mathematical procedures. Now, you're free to disagree with me, and many people do. Okay, but if you look at the world we've created and the effect that mentalism has had on people, if you have the eyes to see the spiritual corruption, you will understand that overall for a society it's not a good path. Not a good path. And you may ask yourself this. Why is it at this time in history do we not have any contact with extraterrestrials or gods, which in the past have walked on the earth, okay, lived amongst us, did not hide from us? And very often, the point of appearance of these races was the point at which the society was living most mythically, most, most by story and dream and intuition, okay? Maybe they don't show up because they don't want to be captured, dissected, and deconstructed, which is what we do to everything. Maybe they don't show up and announce themselves because we're too barbaric. And all of this taking place at a time where we think we're living at the height of civilization. No, we are, we are at present living at the height of barbarity. This is a barbaric world we're living in now. This is not a civilized world, okay? Now, this is, don't, don't conflate this with my, a belief on my part that you always have to live in nature, live simply, grow a little bit of food, 
um, at, to have a meaningful and balanced life, I would say that it would definitely help, but you don't need it. Other people can adapt to the systems. And for other people, the mental curiosity is a tremendous stimulus for them. Tremendous stimulus for them. So I understand that as well. I also have mental curiosities, which are of tremendous stimulation for me as well. But they're generally uh, related to my overall passion of, the, let's call it the, the energetics of story and the energetics of drama. What creates a tension that creates the trance in people that you grab their attention and they keep turning the page or they keep viewing the play or they keep watching the movie? What does that? What is the magic of that process? And more importantly, what are we giving up now that we're destroying that? Because story is being destroy destroyed now. This is the... Okay, we're back. That, that, that happens a fair bit up here where you get these little glitches in the power system. I could easily circumvent this with a backup battery rack of car batteries or something, but I'm just extremely lazy about these things. Sometimes the power goes out for a fair bit of time and you just light some candles and sit around and talk. It's, it's quite nice. So story is being destroyed now as well. So what is, what is story? Well, it's a beginning and a middle and an end. It teaches us something. We've used story as the main teaching tool since the beginning of time. Now, can we do without story? I don't know. In 3D, I don't know. I, I don't think so. Not, not as the new souls are coming in. Because remember, this is a constant process. There, th there are people in human form now that have been down here learning for untold numbers of years, eons and eons and eons, going back to the Lemurians, the Atlanteans. There's, a, there's groupings of souls that have been learning on this planet for a long time. And then there's other groupings of souls that are just coming up from the mammalian level. Okay, so they're, they're, they're just coming up from finishing all the mammal incarnations and getting their first human incarnations. And we all look the same. Two eyes, two, no, two nostrils, a mouth and two ears. Uh, two legs, two arms, five fingers, five toes. We, we all look the same, but we're not. We're not. This is not to say that I believe that a caste system or a class system has to be applied. I think generally the more advanced people, the more um, unfolded people have a greater obligation to serve the other people. But this is just part of what's going on here. So circling back, we've got the adrenochrome we know this is going on, okay? So you can um, take a look at this if you want to. Most of the scientific research on adrenochrome, it was done at the Wayford Institute in Saskatchewan, Canada in the 50s and 60s. And it was done by an, uh, a group of three scientists, chemists and biologists. And they were looking for a cure for schizophrenia. Very interesting story. So if you just go adrenochrome Saskatchewan research in the YouTube search queue or the Rumble search queue or Odyssey or wherever you get your video content, you'll probably find a very good documentary on this if you want to know more about it. Um, but as a recreational substance and as a substance that's harvested and used within the satanic circles, 
The first indication we get of this is in 1971 from Hunter S. Thompson in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. So again, how prolific is this? I don't know. But if there are 10 million, and once you start using it, apparently it's, it's the ultimate addiction. Like you're not, you're not coming off of it once you're using it. So, hey buddy. I think that it may be used as one of the control drugs in the cult for the lower ranks, okay? Because remember, not everybody is die hard, okay? There's various, um, there's a series of concentric circles. The inner circle is the inner circle. And those would be the people that know that primarily you're dealing with extra, dark extraterrestrials that are harvesting your planet for resources that they then sell to other races. The narcotics or the chemicals of the human body are not just used and consumed by human beings. They're used and consumed by other ne ne negative extraterrestrials as well. How do I know all this stuff? intuitively being guided to information, intuitively vetting information. And uh, I allow myself a level of skepticism you wouldn't believe. But if spirit wants me to know something, it will just keep hammering it until I, get, I go, okay, I understand. I will write about it. I will talk about it. I, you know, because that's my job is to just sort of push these things out. And join it all together as a story. And that's really what the devil in us is. It's the story of the human race as we go through this great, this great plan or this ham-fisted plan of the Satanists to take over the planet, which is just absolutely ridiculous because they can't run anything because they're a parasitic culture. And I, I, I think it's starting to dawn on them now that declaring themselves so openly and risking the termination of the host was probably a bad idea because they are fundamentally a parasitic organization. And anything that cuts itself off from God, the source of life, the source of energy, the source of consciousness, anybody or any group that does that will, will become parasitic, okay? This, I think this is what Bram Stoker was getting at in the Dracula movie. We see aspects of it as well. Now, we get it in inverse in Mary Shelley and Frankenstein. This is something that is created outside of the process of normal creation of life, sentient life. And the problem with the monster is it wants to know what it is. And it wants to know what it connects to and what its purpose is kind of more, more of a foreshadowing in Mary Shelley of the journey of artificial intelligence more so than the, what was once human lost its hu humanity by disconnecting from God and becoming parasitic and cannibalistic to other human beings. This is what Bram Stoker was about getting at. And then we get the inverse, this sort of ACDC in Mary Shelley and Frankenstein. And um, very interesting how these, and th those two instances are the first really sort of generally proliferated instances of um, these moral and ethical dilemmas that we would be confronted with as human beings, okay? Very fascinating stuff to get into. Very, very, very fascinating stuff to study. All right, so the other thing, so we've done adrenochrome war. War is part of the blood chapter as well, okay? War is very often blood ritual sacrifice, mass blood ritual sacrifice, and it serves the ancillary benefit of the ruling classes and the ruling bloodlines of depopulating the earth because there are thresholds of human beings that they don't need. Um, this might sound shocking to some of you who listen to me, but... One of the main jobs of the Vatican throughout its history uh, until more scientific organizations like the United Nations took over, um, one of its main jobs was population management. And this is, this is just absolutely true, okay? The, the Vatican and the Catholic Church have been involved in pop, deliberate population reduction for centuries. 
Not so much anymore, like I said, other institutions have taken over. And when you look at the, the concept of forming a moral code in a society, you're basically creating an excuse to kill certain people, okay? Now, the very best societies would be the ones that kill the worst people. Okay? Should there be a death penalty for murderers and rapists? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that we're just uh, doing a great disservice to ourselves and the Creator by keeping murderers and rapists alive. Okay? Shocking. I know. Maybe some of you thought I was liberal and compassionate in my worldview. Oh, give him another chance. Uh, you know, he only raped seven women and it, he only did it because of his upbringing. No. It doesn't matter. Just just nip it in the bud. If we had been following this protocol um, for the last few centuries, we wouldn't be in, in, in the trouble we're in now, being run by satanic institutions. So war has always been a form of population control as well. There's absolutely no doubt about it. You see that in World War I, you see it in World War II, and it also moves forward an agenda, okay? So the agenda that has been coming up quietly, off to the side so it doesn't draw too much attention, but the number one thing that has been very consistent and persistent for, a, over, for 100 years now is the, is the dream of Theodore Herzl, the dream of Zionism. He's just the front man. Zionism goes way before that, okay? Way before that. So this is the consistent story we see coming up through the 20th century, and now it's cresting in the 21st century, okay? Any day now, any week now, any month now, any year now, I'm not sure which one it's going to be, but let's just say it's cued. It's cube in the, cued in the event timeline. When it's let out of its chute to come into our timeline, I can't say for sure. But the third temple of Solomon will most definitely be built. Not as the edifice of the Jews. The third temple of Solomon was many things, or the temple of Solomon was many, many things, okay? Okay many things. But mainly in its last instance under Solomon, it was, the, it was the ritual kill site for the Moloch worship as well. So Moloch and Yahweh were worshipped side by side. Side by side. Okay? According to the mythology. Very interesting. So this has been a goal of the secret societies. This is, this, this is why Israel is such an untouchable subject. This is why you, 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 you can't really speak about it. The, the level of control that the, the, the groups invested in this, which again, are not all Jewish. You don't have to be Jewish to be a Zionist, okay? Um, the groups that are invested in this have been meticulous in acquiring the power in our, in our Western societies. And that's the power of the media. What does that do? Well, it makes a laughing stock of something like Comet Pizza, okay? Which is not a laughing stock, but probably, I mean, look. When you develop the eyes to see this, it's just, it's right in front of you, okay? All the time. It's like a satanic mockery ritual. Look at this. We're, we're, showing these, we're showing this to the dumb monkeys and they don't even know what, we, what we're showing them. And they, they love to do this. They love to mock us. You know, how stupid we are. It's one of their favorite pastimes. So this is in front of us all the time now. No, it, you, you can see it almost everywhere. Everywhere. Christianity is leading us towards a mass culling, okay? <coughs> now, you have to understand how consciousness works. You have to understand how literal the Creator is. 
and really how service oriented the creator is. The creator will give you exactly what you ask for. But you have to know what you're asking for, both at a conscious and an unconscious level. So if you're a Christian and you worship the brutal torture and murder of alleged murder of a man 2,000 years ago, and he's the penultimate of human expression to you, the Savior, you would do anything to, to sort of emulate that. Well, what are you saying? How do you think the, the, the infinite cosmology, which is set up to give us what we need through the law of manifestation, how do you think it interprets that? I'll give you a hint. It's unfolding around you right now. Okay? It's unfolding around you right now. You've got... You've got people now like... Um, willing to die for the environment now. And that, that, that's a bullshit thing, the whole climate change and everything. Is there overconsumption of resource, overutility of nitrous fertilizers on the earth? Absolutely. Are we going to have an event or, or, or events related to food collapse? Absolutely. Okay? But climate change has nothing to do with it. So on the one hand, they're saying that we have to produce less carbon. And on the other hand, they're jamming everybody into cities which are the largest carbon emitters, okay? If any of you have ever been to one of these absolutely, unbelievably big cities population-wise, and here I'm talking about a city like New Delhi, India, a city like Mexico City in Mexico, there are cities out there, Tokyo, there are cities out there, folks, that have populations in excess of 20, 25, 30 million people. Cities. Okay? Canada, which is one of, if not the largest country in the world, equal to or a little bit bigger than even China, okay? The total population of the country is 37 million. But nobody wants to go out into the frontier hinterland and build intentional communities and draw water from the rivers and, and build greenhouses and keep... Uh, livestock to sustain themselves with dairy products and live simply okay nobody wants to do it so everybody's cramming into montreal if they speak french toronto if they speak english vancouver if they're asian or chinese specifically okay like i probably 50 60 percent 70 percent of the population of canada is jammed into maybe five cities um Vancouver, well, the greater Vancouver area, including, you know, all the ancillary areas. Calgary. Um, Winnipeg would be the biggest city in Manitoba. Um, Saskatoon in Saskatchewan. Uh, Toronto in Ottawa. Uh, Toronto in Ontario. And then Ottawa has about a million people. Then you've got Montreal, which has the, a significant portion of the French community, although actually the French distribute out more, okay? Um, and that's the way people live. Everybody wants to go into these big city magnets. To my sensibilities, after 10 years of living up here, I mean, it's, it's about the worst way you could live. I, don't, I just simply do not understand why people want to live that way. I guess they're incentivized in a lot of ways. So adrenochrome, war, um, the two colors of blood, blue when it's inside your body, the blue veins, I can't pop a vein right now, but it's, it's blue inside the body and red outside right w what color do you get when you mix blue and red purple what's the color of royalty purple it's the two states of blood oxygenated and unoxygenated or exposed externally to oxygen and not exposed to oxygen 
So blood is really sort of central to everything that's going on here. It's the center of the rituals. The spilling of blood is um, very exciting for these people. And um, I don't think that this blood culture has ever been on, exhibited more than it is now. It's like epidemic now. Absolutely epidemic. Okay, so... That's about everything we need to discuss about blood. And I want to close, and the, the next chapter is Event Horizon, which ties everything together. Where is all of this leading? And ultimately, it's leading to a good place because, as I said, the left hand and the right hand work together. Okay? So human consciousness is pushed and pulled and prodded, and eventually it, it, it just sort of pops into a new understanding. This is the way we evolve, okay? Not gently. And it can be quite terrifying at times. I mean, to leave behind everything you thought you knew was reality, to embrace a greater reality, is a terrifying thing. Especially if the reality that you're living in is extremely comfortable and meets all of your material needs and gives you title and status in the world in which you live. We love this, don't we? I mean, I, 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 I've noticed this even in the alternative media now, people having their, their, their bios read, you know, and, and so much of the accreditation, which would allow us to maybe think that what they're saying is true, is leveraged off the completely corrupt society, you know? And this, this is what's going on to our precious uh, free speech medium, um, that we all use here, you know, through the form of podcasting and YouTubing and things like this. And it's being encroached upon by more and more mainstream people. But you know what? I don't trust them. I don't trust them. And you know why I don't trust them? Because they don't tell the truth. You know, sometimes people say to me off air, Bruce, you know, it's, it's really uncouth to name people and to point fingers. Why? If a single group of people and their behavior are leading hundreds of millions and billions of people into cataclysm, terror, and a cat catastrophic end, why would you not say that out loud? Why would you not say that out loud? Okay? Now, and, and, and there's all these, let's call them undertones now. Okay, so you, you, you get Tucker Carlson, well, we shouldn't be in any foreign wars that don't serve America. And you get Ben Shapiro biting back, and a lot of the Jewish, prominent Jewish intellectuals in America going after Tucker Carlson, going after Candace Owens and things like that. Why don't you just come out and say what it is? Okay, why just go back to the question I asked in Blood Part 3. Why are we not going to the Hannibal Lecters of blood to understand who is perpetrating these blood atrocities, whether it be adrenochrome, whether it be child ritual sacrifice, whether it be the sacrifice of adult human beings, whether it be the rape circles, the slave circles, who's, who would be in a better position to know where this is coming from other than the Jews? And they demand that they control all of the gateways to public information in Western society, and nobody is speaking publicly about these topics. Why? And th don't get me wrong, it's not just the Jews. The Vatican's in on it now too, okay? Big time. They're doing, they do these blood rituals under the Vatican now. They've been doing them for decades. Okay? Everybody's in on it now. Mother Teresa was a... So if you think I'm just picking on the Jews, remember, my thesis is basically the Abrahamic system at the leadership level. But I think the people who sort of spun it all up and got it all started, there's little doubt based on my research and my intuitive understanding given to me through spiritual insight that this can be squarely be placed at the feet of the Jews. So why is it so terrible to say this? Here's another contrast going back to the 1947 chapter where I made the comparison between the, Jew, uh, the Zionists and the Nazis, okay? We to this day in a Jewish-dominated media continue to vilify 
the Germans for their attempted genocide and depopulation of certain populations at the very same time were doing it on a scale that's 20 or 30 to 1 what what was done in Europe <laughs> it's 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 like the black lives matter people going on and on about slavery 200 years ago when we have the highest per capita level of slavery the world has perhaps ever known going on in the world right now you see how we get it all screwed up with our virtue signaling and our bullshit and our inability to just say the truth? Okay? If you're a powerful voice out there, you're either going to get bought out with money like Joe Rogan or you're going to get bought out with flattery and inclusion like Jordan Peterson. But they've both cut their nuts off. They can't tell you the truth. The truth is we're controlled by a blood cult that wants to build the third temple of Solomon and rule the world under Noahide law. And it has ancillary components in all kinds of secret societies. Now it's all collapsing now. They're, not, they're probably not going to achieve their goal or they're going to achieve it and only be able to hold on to it for a very short period of time, 7, 10, 12 years, but the amount of pain and suffering we're all going to have to go through as a human race, broken supply chains, famine, disruption to human systems that keep people alive, we're all going to have to live through that because nobody has the guts to just say, why aren't the Jews telling us who's doing the blood rituals? Why don't the Jews tell us what they know about blood? It's that simple. I'm Bruce McDonald and this has been the Talamanca Review.